Hello, and welcome to another live broadcast with MedStar Health. My name is Michelle Bowman, and today I'm joined by Dr. Terry Fairbanks, Emergency Physician and Vice President of Quality and Safety for MedStar Health. Dr. Fairbanks has been helping to manage our pandemic crisis response on behalf of MedStar Health from the very beginning and has worked long hours on plans to keep our patients and associates safe. So if you want to learn more about receiving care at one of our locations, or scheduling an elective procedure, keep watching, share this broadcast with your friends on social media, and ask us questions in the comments below. So welcome, Dr. Fairbanks. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, before we get started, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, well, first, I'm really proud to serve MedStar Health in our safety mission, and my career really uh, led up to this. I started my career early on as a safety engineer. I even did environmental safety work, keeping workers safe on, on construction sites and that led to a human factors innovation and safety work at, as a paramedic. Eventually I became an emergency physician and over time I got more and more involved in leading safety programs um, and I've been at MedStar Health for 10 years doing uh, different kind of innovation in safety work and for the last four years I've been involved in leading the quality and safety program. Our quality and safety program at MedStar Health involves infection prevention. And so for the last year, in, two years in particular, as I've led safety overall for MedStar Health, I've been deeply involved in helping our infection prevention teams keep our patients safe from infections and also keep all of our associates safe from getting infections. It's all very important. Thank you so much again. Um, so let's get started. Um, how did you know that it was safe to open our doors for elective cases at MedStar Health? Well, first I want to, um, so, in MedStar Health, I'm very proud of the fact that when the governor of Maryland said that we could start doing elective surgeries, we elected to wait 10 days, and we very carefully went back and looked at everything we had done since January to prepare for safety, knowing that we were going to start taking more patients in than the, than the necessary emergencies. We would increase our volume, and we would be opening new offices that had been shut down since uh, COVID time. During that 10 day period, we assessed everything. We looked at the way we were going to space waiting rooms, um, the way that we were going to have patients come in and serve them differently. Um, we looked at our protective equipment to make sure we had enough. We looked at our lab testing to make sure we could test patients before procedures. What, what that did is it rolled up all the weeks and really months of work that we had done in preparation since January for COVID, looked at our current COVID precautions, and put them in place in a new way to be able to open up these elective procedures. Your question was much more specific than that. It was to say what, what kinds of things we had done. And I do have a list I'm proud of, so I'm gonna just kind of go down it. Okay. Um, one is the, the lab testing. I mentioned the lab testing. Right. Um, during the COVID crisis, up until the time we started doing elective procedures, um, if you needed an emergency procedure, you needed an emergency procedure. And as much as possible, we would test people for COVID before they went down to the operating room, for example. Mm -hmm. But it's a little different with elective surgeries because the patient and their physician and the surgeon are together trying to make a decision about whether it's the right time to do the surgery. We like to make these decisions together with the patient. Part of that risk assessment always involves knowing if a patient has COVID or not. And as I'm sure everyone is aware, one of the reasons that masking is so critical and the reason you and I are masked because we're six feet apart um, is because there's an average of five days for every person who has COVID that they don't know they have it. So for an average of five days, but it can be up to 10 or 14 days, a patient has gotten the infection, is shedding the virus so they're contagious, and they're, but they don't know they have it. What we want to do is not bring those patients to the operating room for two reasons. One is, in their post-operative period when they're recovering, they could have worse complications. They, they could have a complication because of the fact that they had COVID and we didn't know. The second reason is we're very focused on keeping our other patients safe and keeping our associates safe. We need our associates to be comfortable and safe and we need them um, to, we need our other patients to be comfortable and safe as well. So the testing is a critical part. We now test every single patient who gets an elective procedure. And 
the vast majority of them are negative. It's only about two to three percent that have been positive in that process. Okay. Um, but if, if they do have a positive test, we have a full discussion with them. And, and if it's fully elective, we always delay it. Okay. We don't have them come to the operating room. The second thing that we did um, outside of surgery, mm -hmm. um, when we started to open up the doctor's offices and have the doctors um, uh, be able to see more patients as well as more surgeries occurring, is we ensured that all of our providers were completely up to date on all the right, all the staff in the, in the, in the offices, up to date on the right ways to protect themselves and to protect the patients from each other. Um, that means masking, and as everyone knows, we mask for two reasons. One is it protects you, but it also protects others from you if you're in that five day or so period when you're shedding virus but don't know it. Mm -hmm. um, this, and we do universal masking at MedStar Health. Every patient, visitor, associate always has a mask on. The only exception to that, which we make other precautions around, is if a patient comes into the ER with a breathing emergency where it's better to have it off. But as a side note, um, for decades, staff in the OR have been wearing masks all day long, even when they have asthma and other problems. People with normal respiratory problems are okay with masks. So masks are safe. There's no medical exclusion necessary for masks, except in that extreme condition when you're coming into the OR, or to the ER. So we do universal masking. That really keeps us safe from each other. We do distancing. Uh, and we set up the waiting rooms to ensure that distancing is easy. We don't want it to be on our patients and visitors to have to worry about their distancing. Right. We want to make it easy and facilitate it. We've done things like reduce the chairs in the waiting rooms. Um, we have, um, even in many cases, if a patient's able to, we will have them check in and then wait in their car. We call them in so they're not waiting around other people. We've reduced the number of appointment frequency so that there's not as many people around, so it's easy to space. Um, we present people with a mask when they come in if they don't have one. We also do a pretty extensive cleaning and disinfecting program. We use only the EPA approved disinfectants that we know will kill COVID, but we also worry about other infections and viruses like we always have. Um, however, we do our extra cleaning between patients. Hand sanitizing paramount. As you know, the two ways you can get COVID or you can breathe it in or you can touch it to your hands and then your hands touch your eyes or, or mouth. It's worth noting you can't catch COVID because you touch COVID. You catch COVID because it gets on your hands and then it gets to your eyes or your mouth, which are an entry period. I mean an entry mechanism. Um, one more thing that I'll mention that we do to keep people safe is we do screen our patients and visitors and our associates. So we ask our associates to self-screen. We have them be aware of all of the symptoms. And if they're sick, we fully support them. If there's even a touch of symptoms, stay home. And we do screen our visitors uh, and patients coming in. Any signs of COVID, we ask them not to enter the environment. And that helps keep our patients safe. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, giving people the assurance to know that when they come into our locations, they know that we're doing our part to keep them safe. Um, so with that said, I think you mentioned a little bit about the process for elective procedures, but could you elaborate a little bit more for those who need to schedule one? Yes, um, so I did mention that we do a pre-procedural COVID test for every patient. Um, we have it a few days ahead of time and we ask the patient to quarantine. And that's important for two reasons. Um, one is that if you, if you do it a few days ahead of time, you also, if you get it right afterwards and the positive test, you'll be able, you'll see the symptoms occurring. Um, this, once we know that the test is negative, um, then we proceed with the procedure. Now taking a step back, if you've been, you've had some issue, maybe a hernia or something that you had advice at some point needed surgery, but you were able to put it off because of COVID, which was what we asked everyone to do is put on hold anything that wasn't urgent or emergent. Um, then the first step would be to talk to the doctor that would be the appropriate referral. So if it's your primary care doctor talking about you may need a surgery, have another visit, virtual visit or in person, whatever it, uh, they're doing right now, and ask them if they think it's appropriate for you to move forward. Or talk to the surgeon if you had already re been um, referred or pick up a phone and call a surgeon's office and say, I think I need this surgery. All of our surgeons, our, our staff that support them, our nurses, 
everyone's really well aware of the sensitivity of how people are feeling about this tough decision because people are worried and right. they want to know that they're making the right decision and we will think that through with you if the decision is made to proceed with the surgery and get the covid test if it shows you don't have covid we proceed in a very safe manner if it shows you have covid we have a discussion we have counselors to help you figure out how to how to work with that and we reschedule for at least 30 days thank you um, so you mentioned the importance of getting the test before your procedure mm -hmm. um, if you need a test how do you get one before your procedure if you need a test before your procedure, your surgeon or the, the anesthesia preoperative testing or your primary care doctor can refer you to one of many sites in the area. MedStar has a number of sites that do this testing. They'll hand you a list that gives you the options so you can find one nearest your, um, your home. And we also have this available on our website. I will note that um, there is still a, a scarcity in, in the region and nationally of the uh, instant test to tell you the answer right away. And that's one reason we do it a few days out so that you can do the regular test, which is much more available. And I'll make a second note, because sometimes people ask, um, that we're talking about the nasal swab test or what the doctors call a PCR test, um, not the antibody test. Okay. The antibody test is still in research. It's still used. We're still studying it and figuring out nationally what it means. But what we do know it can never tell us is whether you have a disease you just got. So it's never useful for the instant diagnosis of a disease. Good point to add. Uh, those are two different things. <laughs> um, so for a patient who has an emergency and they don't have time to get a test, will they still receive treatment? Great question. Thank you for asking that. And as an ER doctor, close to my heart, <laughs> um, if somebody needs treatment, they get treatment, period, absolutely. Um, and so we do have cases, for example, in we. Medstar Washington Hospital Center is a huge trauma center. Uh, we have traumas that come in, have to go straight to the operating room. All of our emergency departments deal with all kinds of emergencies that may need emergency surgery or other emergency procedures. What we do in that case is we do extra protection for our associates, surgeons, nurses, and staff in the, uh, in the procedure room, as well as other patients, to ensure that in the small chance which we think is about 2% based okay. on our other, and the small chance that that patient had COVID and didn't know it, mm -hmm. everyone's still protected. Very good, thank you. Um, if you're just uh, joining us, thanks for tuning in. We are live with Dr. Terry Fairbanks, Emergency Physician and Vice President of Poly and Safety for Mesta Health. Today we're discussing what Mesta Health is doing to keep our patients and associates safe. So as you watch this broadcast, feel free to share it with your friends on social media. Give us a like to let us know that you're watching. And if you have any questions, please share them in the comments below. We're going to take some time to answer those as well. So continuing on with our questions, um, how are you keeping non-COVID patients safe while also treating those affected by COVID? That's a great question. Um, so first, we do separation. And we call it cohorting. So you may hear the doctors and nurses call, call out cohorting. Um, if a patient has symptoms of COVID, when they come in the ER or the doctor's office, they're treated as a likely or potential COVID patient and they're kept separate from other patients, both with protection as they described that we're doing universally, mm -hmm. but also with treating them separately in, in terms of um, where they're taken care of. Um, and there's really three categories, right? There's the people that we know don't have COVID and they can comfortably go to a unit or, or a space where other patients without COVID are. Then there's patients we know have COVID. And then in the middle, there's patients that might have COVID. And so we treat all three of those separately. We're not gonna put people that might have COVID with sure thing COVID patients and expose them. So separ separation is a big part of this. We have a very high index of suspicion. And if we think it's possible somebody has COVID, we do treat them as a separately. We treat them separately. We call them people under investigation. It's kind of a silly, <laughs> silly word, but that's our term that we use to, to convey to each other mm -hmm. that this person should be protected and kept from other folks. Right, right. Um, what should patients do if they start feeling sick before their appointment? Oh, really important question. Um, if you feel sick before your appointment, you should call the physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or other mid nurse midwife, whoever your provider is whose office or appointment that you have 
that you are going to keep. You might be a physical therapist. We do ask that you to call the office before you come in. And this is one of our ways of keeping other patients safe, even though we do hand people a mask at the door if they don't have one. Um, we do want people that are sick to stay home. We also want to take care of you. So if you're sick and have questions, um, we do have, as I'm sure folks know, we have a very robust telehealth yeah. um, service. We have the urgent care available through telehealth, and often they'll refer patients to that as a screening tool to see if they can be cared for at home uh, or if they need to go to the ER. Our primary care doctors all do video visits, so you can also call them up and say, and many of our surgeons do this too, can't come to your office, but can we do a video visit and talk it through? For the most part, unless it's urgent, we would have people reschedule until the symptoms are clarified. Mm -hmm. And one reason I'm really glad you asked that question is I want patients to keep in mind, because people are, are people have put off care that they needed exactly. for quite some time. So I think many of our patients want to come in and receive the care. Uh, I know I personally just made a, an appointment today with my doctor because <laughs> I needed my regular annual checkup and I felt like I should be doing it too. Um, and we want to do this, right. and then we get symptoms, like maybe a sore throat and a cough, and we think, oh, it's nothing, I really need to see the doctor. I would caution you on that, okay. not only doing your part in society and not potentially being near others, but also it, medical procedures when you might have COVID could put, put, put you in danger, because COVID does complicate the course of any treatment that we do. So for those both reasons, I would really encourage our patients to have a low threshold to declare it if they think they might be feeling sick. Thank you. Um, so if I need a number of screenings, uh, which doctor should I see first? Well, of course, we have a robust primary care network in MedStar Health, and we always recommend that you start with your primary care doctor. Okay. Primary care is essential because your doctor knows you or your team of doctors knows you if you're seen by a primary care office. They have continuity in your record. They can best take care of your different issues. Mm -hmm. Sometimes patient wonder, patients wonder if it's more efficient to figure out on their own what specialists they may need. Our primary care doctors have very close relationships with the different specialists. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you're in better hands if you start there and then figure out which direction to go. Very good to know. Um, so what have you seen in your experience that makes you feel that people are avoiding care? Maybe they're a little afraid of the atmosphere, yeah. everyone's uh, a little stressful during this time, so what do you say about yeah. that? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question, and there are um, a couple of things, things that you would all think of, like people with chest pain that might have had a lower threshold to say, I should go to the ER because I might be having a heart attack, and people know time makes a difference with that. Right, right. Since the beginning of COVID, we've seen less people come in early with those kinds of complaints. They're often waiting till they're, they're really worried, mm -hmm. and we have seen effect, negative effect from that. We have had people wait till it's too late, and that is one thing that we've seen. The second thing is less of the life-threatening nature, but the comfort nature. Uh, things like kidney stones, which are horribly painful, Yes. Um, many of you have probably had kidney stones. I'm lucky I haven't yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yes, they're, they're apparently like some of the worst pain in the world. I would argue it probably doesn't beat childbirth, but it's pretty bad. Um, we do see um, a dramatic reduction in number of patients coming to our ERs with kidney stones. And that to me is very telling because we know there's not less kidney stones. There's nothing magical. <laughs> so people are staying home and bearing horrible pain. Um, probably, I, I think, you know, we think it's because they're worried about their safety. I would say, you can be comfortable. This is what I'm telling my family members. You can be comfortable now going to the ER in normal circumstances. Our ERs and other offices that you might come to with, with, with acute problems like that are really well prepared to keep you safe. You're not going to be put in a position where you have more of a chance of getting exposed to COVID. And, and frankly, I feel safer when I'm in our hospitals than I do walking down the street some days. And, and I think many of you experience that when you're in the community. So in, in terms of the more uh, severe conditions like cancer, how concerned are you that, that people are becoming sicker uh, and, and might not reach out for that care when a timely diagnosis is very important. Yeah. Well, I, I try to be always careful and 
talk about the facts. Uh, I certainly have the sense that where we're seeing data on kidney stones and chest pain, etc., I have the sense that people are delaying care in cancer cases, or they feel a lump, or they have a um, pain that's unusual. Um, I have a sense that's happening, but it's too early for me to factually say we're seeing that in the data. Um, what I would say is that cancers come at all different levels of aggressiveness depending on the cell that it comes from. Some cancers go very, very fast, some grow very slowly. Um, if it happens to be one of the faster growing uh, kinds of cancer, then time can have a huge difference. Mm -hmm. time, time can make a difference um, between your stage that you are diagnosed with and the level of aggressiveness of treatment that you might need, and, and potentially even your outcome. So this is uh, one of our last questions. So if a patient had COVID-19, but they recovered, can they still come to the hospital and other locations? What's the protocol in that case? Great question. I'm going to answer that question in two ways. Okay. So um, first, the visitor question, right? Because we we have been, all hospitals across the country have been very careful. One of the ways that we've stayed, stayed safe, and I didn't mention this earlier, is to limit visitors um, so that we don't have any unnecessary surprise exposures that might occur just in the public environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do know also that the highest risk factor, the highest risk of anybody out there getting COVID is if they live with somebody with COVID. Okay. So we've been very careful about people that live with someone with COVID um, staying isolated as, as much as, as they can. Um, we have learned, you know, as science has evolved around COVID over the time, um, if you had asked uh, the top scientists two months ago, they would not have known the answer to um, how long we should wait. We now know, and the CDC, which is our guiding light in terms of standards for this, the CDC has recently released a guidance that says, if you are horribly ill with, with COVID and you are, had to be in the ICU and all that, then you need to wait 20 days from the time that you're better. Okay. And um, However, if you have a normal case of COVID, you haven't been in the ICU, you've been, and by normal case, people that have COVID say that it's sometimes the worst experience of their life. It feels like having the flu three times over. It's miserable. So I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, but for those cases, it's 10 days that is safe. Okay. So um, once a patient has COVID, they get better, they wait 10 days. Um, we know that they're okay to, in terms of exposing other people. Two things to note about that. One is the CDC has said, stop testing. So initially we all tested, after 10 days, we might have sent you for, a, for 20 or 30 days. We might have sent you for a repeat test and we're gonna say you're not, you're not safe until it's a normal test. But what the scientists have realized is that there are still fragments of the virus that are not active, that persist. So you may have a false positive test, meaning it shows you have COVID, but you really don't, you're not contagious. So the CDC just last week said, no more testing is necessary if it's been 10 days after your illness, unless you were really sick when it's 20. Uh, you're okay to return uh, as a non-contagious person. So thank you so much for explaining all of those details. Very good information to take note of. Uh, we did receive a few questions uh, from viewers on social media, so let's take some time to answer those. Great. Um, so we have David who asks, how often do medical residents and nurses test who are exceeding 20 hour shifts in the hospital? Um, well, first I'll say there's kind of two things embedded in there. Mm -hmm. One is um, with the federal government and our, our approach anyway has been to really limit the hours of our trainees to a safe environment. And we follow all those. Um, and so that I'll, I'll take the hours part out of that, mm -hmm. but I'll say, for any associate, whether it be a resident or uh, uh, attending or nurse, we're following the same CDC guidelines that, that say if there's symptoms and if there's um, if there's a reason to believe there's COVID, mm -hmm. then we test. Um, we always take people out during symptoms just in case the test is positive. Then we don't return them back into the environment until we know that they're safe and not contagious. Um, 
The second thing that we look at is very high level exposures. Um, if we have a, a medical provider who's had a uh, what the CDC defines as an exposure, we call it a high level exposure, um, then we also test those people uh, to ensure that they that they are okay. The primary cause, as we've this is a recent change, the primary cause as time has gone on has been self monitoring and just being really careful about if you have any symptoms, making sure that you let your supervisor know mm -hmm. uh, so you can stay home. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question from uh, Pamela. She says, how safe is it for a patient undergoing a surgical procedure during COVID-19? I think we touched on this a little earlier, but could you uh, yeah. elaborate a little bit on that process? Um, so the general question, you said from Pamela? Uh, that, yes, Pamela. That Pamela mm -hmm. asked, um, it's just as safe as before COVID, hands down, unless you might have COVID. So, the, mm -hmm. so that's why we do the, the, the COVID testing. There's nothing about COVID now that we've really done everything to protect and to set up the right environment and to lighten our schedule. Um, I would even argue it could be safer because everybody's so careful about everything. But just in general, there's nothing less safe about a procedure today as there was before COVID. The one nuance to that is you want to make sure that you don't have COVID because that's the one time that it could be less safe for you is if you have COVID and then you go in for a surgery, that your your recovery can be more difficult because your body is fighting an infection and trying to recover from the surgery. And that's no different from any other infection. Usually we would always, unless there's an emergency surgery, we would always put off a surgery if somebody uh, were ill with other problems, including infections. Thank you for responding to that. Thank you, Pamela, for sending that question in. And that is a wrap for today's broadcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Fairbanks, for joining us. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in and asked questions. We really appreciate it. For more information about uh, scheduling appointments and how we're keeping our patients and associates safe, please visit medstarhealth.org safe. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.